Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. Night, the short staff, but we're still here. My opposite number, Tom Norman. How you doing, Tom? Good, Kevin. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. So, uh, Shop Talk, rules of the game. This is chat interactive. If you have questions, drop them in chat. We will uh, drive off of that. Otherwise, I have show notes to my left that I surreptitiously look at and sometimes blatantly look at. With all that said, let's get on with the first topic of tonight. And that topic, Tom and I were just talking about this. So you just did a uh, workshop for O'Reilly. Yeah, I did. I did a workshop for O'Reilly and um, I was talking to Kevin about using uh, labs.azure.com. And uh, we kind of briefly talked about it before, but if you're a speaker and you're, you want to do a lab for someone, highly recommend it. It, it turned out to be very, very well uh, received. Um, I was able to totally prep it. Uh, basically, you have a template that you totally prep. You can uh, then basically you publish this this uh, template. Uh, you can then log into it yourself and basically walk totally walk through your lab, so you're not messing up your template. So you can totally walk through the lab as a as a user how they would log into it. Uh, you've got the right to basically either. Uh, already have the information and send them the links so they can log in, or you can turn around and actually uh, just have it unrestricted. Uh, it is a VM, so they have to log into it. So even if they did find the link, they still have to have the password to get in. I actually, I was telling Kevin that I actually had an eight uh, CPU, 16 gigabyte machine running SQL Server, um, uh, SSMS and Azure Data Studio. And of course we were doing encryption. So, you know, along with all the encryption stuff. So it turned out, um, it, you know, cost me a whole whopping for, they estimated 300 people registered, only there, there are no show factors worse than our SQL Saturdays. I had about 30, 35 people show up and uh, basically, I think it's going to cost me maybe 50, 60 bucks. So, uh, so would highly recommend it. Uh, makes your life a lot easier, and you can you can play with that thing, and you can republish it over and over. Like if you've got an error, like I I went through my notes, and I was like, oh shoot, I didn't put that in there, so I needed to put an additional thing in there uh, in the notes, and then I just went ahead and republished it. Um, all my notes this time and all the lab was in uh, Azure Data Studio uh, mm -hmm. notebooks. So they were just following through with the notebooks of doing it. Uh, the only thing about Azure Data Studio, I would tell tell those guys, you need to allow me to size the image. <laughs> you know, I couldn't size the image, so that was not the prettiest, but it still worked. As in images on the notebook itself? Yeah, images on the note, notebook. So like if you want to do a screenshot, for example, of, you know, go click this and highlight where to click it or whatever, that particular image, it wouldn't allow me to basically, in Azure Data Studio, it wouldn't allow me to, to resize it. Yeah, some Markdown readers will allow you to resize images in Markdown format. Uh, if you use the HTML image tags, that should allow you to set width and height. I think um, Azure Data Studio's Markdown Reader interprets that HTML tag correctly, but I'd have to check. From, from what I was reading, it was because I was using the SQL uh, language, you know, or the SQL, whatever you, you know, you can say PowerShell or SQL or whatever. And it's because I was using SQL, I think it wouldn't allow me to do the resizing. Hmm. At least from what I Googled. I Googled several different people trying to find a way to resize it, but but that's all right. But yeah, if you're if you want to use it, highly recommend it. Very, 
uh, this particular lab I was choosing, it's like 55 cents an hour per per, uh, per uh, VM that it spun up. So if you had 30 of them, you're paying you know, 55 cents per hour times 30. So it's not like it's not like it's really expensive to do it. So uh, it makes those labs. I know Kevin, you were talking to me one time, or we were talking about how you did a pre-con and tried to do a lab, and it was almost like a nightmare because you just have to go behind everybody and tell them to do something. Yep, yep. When you have to install software specifically on everybody's laptops, they have different mixtures of versions of Windows or Mac OS. Um, they have locked down machines. They have all kinds of weird stuff installed. Some people have older versions of some things and working with conflicts, just dealing with a lot of stuff. What's well, interesting, because I did have people that had Macs, and of course the pre-caveat to the class, you know, one of the notes was telling them to go download, if you have, don't already have it, download yourself a uh, RDP, you know, a remote desktop uh, client, client for the Mac. And then they just use that to connect into the cloud, into the lab, and everything worked beautifully. Yeah, yeah. So so you didn't have to worry about what OS they were on or whatever the case may be. So it really made it really made it very nice. Um, so for your lab, did everybody have the same password and account, or are you able to set that on a per user basis? Uh, the way I set it up was everybody had the same login and password. Okay. You know, because, because it was the same. Because you te technically, again, you have a template, right? So you set it up for the template. And of course, it's just cloning that template for you. So everybody technically has the same login and password. Um, you know, you might be able to set it different, but because it's a lab, I, I personally think it's just give them all the same. Who cares? <laughs> you know, they've got their own machine because the one thing they're getting when they when they actually register into your lab, they actually get an RDP session that's theirs. So it's not like they can cross, you know, because you've got your own little download RDP link that says, here's your particular login to your VM. All right, so. right, that makes sense. Uh, so the Duke yep. mentions everybody gone. Um, I understand the context behind that, but I will say that for stream canon purposes, uh, Tracy is currently undercover in the uh, nation of Valverde, where she is trying to overthrow their government and may or may not run into uh, alien hunters. So we'll see. Also, um, I enjoy the idea that Commando and Predator actually take place in the same universe. It may or may not be true, but in my mind, they're in the same universe. And Mala just couldn't make it tonight. For stream canon purposes, she just wasn't available. So if you see Tracy in like 10 weeks and um, I don't know, if you ask her where Carl Weathers went. So I, with that, see if anybody in chat has questions about Azure Labs. Um, it's, I think it's an interesting idea. I may, I may try it out. Seems like it is more for a it's more for training, so if you're not training people actively, then it might not make sense. But you know, just learning how it, how the thing works. So, did you create a VM uh, disk image and basically have that image be saved, or how did you do it? Well, they do have the capability that it is. A, <clears throat> of course, when you log into it, you tell them what size of machine you want. So, and it is a, it is, like I said, it's a template. And then, then you can actually save that template into what they call, I think, shared images or something like that. You can save it into a library. So if you have multiple different ones, you can def definitely save them into a library and then go pull them back out. Uh, Stephanie Locke is the one that basically, uh, you put me on to her, Kevin. And I went and tweeted to her and said, hey, how did you do this? And she told me all about Azure Labs and stuff. And then, then like I said, I went out there and tried it. So, so yeah, you basically choose. It's a template. 
you can save it off. Uh, you can republish it multiple times, like I said. So, you know, if you make a mistake, uh, that was the beauty is I could publish it ahead of time. I could walk through the lab myself and make sure everything was there. So didn't have to guess at the, like going, oops, I forgot the, in fact, the first time I walked through it, I actually had missed a script saving it to the lab machine. So I was able to go back and save that, save that script. And then I had it, of course. Right. But if, but if I would have, um, you know, been walking through it live, it had been, oops, I don't have that script. So I'm in trouble. <laughs> or just skip it like we always do as a speaker, we just go on. So, but as you said, it's more of if you're training people, it's not from the standpoint of you're gonna spin these up just to have them, you know, no, just use Azure, you know, and stuff, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, Mike says, it'd be great to have an educational environment that works really well. Uh, far too many meetings take far too long to set up. Absolutely true. Um, having done some training documentation and also actual trainings, yes, that's that's one of the biggest pain points, just making sure everything is set up and working appropriately because you can get sidetracked really quickly and down some rabbit hole uh, without even wanting to be because, well, I tried to install this thing, but it had a dependency on this thing, but I have an older version of it because this other thing uses the older version and that there's an incompatibility and it becomes a big Yeah, and that's, an, that's the nice part about Azure Labs is basically you're, you're bringing a machine up from, you tell them the OS and stuff that you want to, you know, it's just like bringing up an Azure machine, right? You bring it up and tell them what you want and uh, you're basically configuring it the way you want it to be. So um, that was the beauty of it is, is I didn't have to worry about dependencies. Between the time I first started building it and when we actually gave the class, I of course had to up, you know, uh, there was some service packs released and SSMS had a new version and Azure Data Studio had a new version. So, you know, I went ahead and, and uh, made sure that the machine was, you know, up to the latest version. Right. And Mike's follow-up question, um, did it avoid environment incompatibilities? Mac, PC, Windows, Linux, browser dependencies, yada, yada. Short answer is yes, because you just need an RDP client. It creates a virtual machine and lets you remote desktop into it. Yeah, you're actually, you're actually remoting to the cloud. So the only thing you have to have as a student is make sure that you have access to the internet. And of course, if you're doing a virtual class, you've got access to the internet or you're not gonna have the class anyway. Yeah, and if you build a, a Linux-based VM for the labs, then same deal, it's just you would use SSH. Yeah, yeah, you just have to have uh, uh, the remote capabilities, you know, whatever they may be. So, but yeah, I did have Mac people and I had Windows people, so I had both. And uh, the, the one caveat was, uh, as I basically, in the, the notes basically for the class, we basically told everybody that, have a, ha, that has a Mac, be sure and download a remote desktop client so you can connect. Right. Um, so is this a training that you're looking to give again? I am. In fact, I'm giving it again in December. Uh, December 4th, I'm giving it again for O'Reilly. So I don't know whether I'd have to look at the contract between O'Reilly and myself is if I could actually do it with, you know, like our user group or something like that. So, but I'd have to look at the contract and see if it, see if it allowed me to go outside of, outside of them. They don't, besides videoing it, they don't really have access to the lab, the lab, because I paid for it. So they don't really have access to the lab. They did not pay for it. So, uh, and that was their product. Remember we were talking about it. What's it? Coda, Coda. Catacoda. Catacoda, which strictly is Linux and all that kind of stuff. And what I was doing, I actually needed a Windows environment. 
So I just uh, dropped a link in chat, which was the um, live training that has already completed. So you'll at least get an idea of what it looks like. Um, sounds like Tom's going to be able to do it again. When that comes, we'll we'll push out some info on it in case you're interested in checking that out. December 4th, December doing 4th. it again. Okay. So, so yeah, so if you want to, if you want to come join and listen to it, I, I did tweet it, but I didn't get a lot of, uh, I guess because it's not pass, I didn't get a lot, of, a lot of press on that. So. <laughs> could be, could be. Um, so Mike also mentions that they used RDP uh, and at the university. And the only problem was local files in and out of the remote educational environment. So student files, yeah, I, I get what you mean. Um, where you're trying to copy files in and out of that VM. That is a Windows setting. Um, I cannot remember for the life of me which one it is, but there is a setting on remote desktop that basically allows you to copy and paste across your RDP session and locally. And I want to say that that is something that um, you can set up on the VM level to make it easier for copy and paste. But I have had scenarios where you, you couldn't copy paste across. Also, uh, I had a folder that I had all my material, even even the information of how to create the database from scratch. So right. you know, so you'd have something to work with. And I basically told them to just copy that entire folder off the lab and put it on their local. And then if they wanted to spin it up after, because I gave them like two extra hours to play around with it uh, that I would pay for. And, but I told them basically go download SQL Server Developer Edition, create this database, here's your table, here's your population script, and you can then go use all this stuff. So, so from my perspective, you, know, you could download it now. From a university perspective, they may not want you downloading that information, so they may block it. So, but it, yeah, that could be. Um, so, only a Windows setting on Windows. Uh, not necessarily. I know that I have been able to use RDP clients in Ubuntu to connect to a Windows machine and have been able to copy paste across. Also, uh, I've not done it for Mac OS. I don't really Mac OS at all, but it's not just a Windows Windows. Yeah, I, said, I did not hear from anybody that was in the class. I did not hear from anybody that said they could not download it. You know, it, because they had all my connection information. I told them, you know, if you have an issue, I'll, you know, I'll zip it up myself and send it to you. Right. And I just did a quick look and basically... Um, quite often when you can't copy over, there is a tool called RDP Clip. It's a process that's running in Windows. And that is the remote desktop clipboard. So that's that's how you get data across the two machines, uh, at least when you're going Windows to Windows. And that uh, that can fail sometimes, so you can kill it and restart it. That may also fix your problem. Yeah, and you could have, you know, when you're copying things down locally too, you could have like antivirus. You know, if you're on a work computer, then maybe they don't let you download a .zip file. Uh, you can have all kinds of things that would stop you from allowing you to download it. So, but then you just ask the speaker and you figure out a way to get it to them. Right even maybe putting it up into like Google Drive and, and you know, sharing it with them so they can turn around and download it through Google Drive or some other way. Uh, clipboard worked to the Raspberry Pi OS, probably Raspbian, uh, RDP out of the box for you. Cool, yeah, it's, you can get clipboard working cross operating system. It's not guaranteed to work perfectly, but when it does, it's it's great. Yeah. 60% of the time, it works every time. 
but it's nice to have a a way as a speaker, especially these guys doing pre cons, half days, you know, whatever, or you're doing, or you end up doing a training like I did, and you need labs and stuff. This is one way to do it and and to test it. That was the great part. That's what I really loved. I was able to test it before I even gave it. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a nice uh, scenario to be in because quite often you write up this lab and as you're writing it, you say, oh, whoops, I forgot this thing. Well, let me shove it in this part of the lab and you know, I'm sure that it'll work because I ran the script and it ran successfully. And if you don't go back and walk through step by step again, you may have put that in the wrong place where, oh, that script doesn't exist yet, or this, this has a dependency on something that doesn't exist yet. Or you actually try to run it and it gives you an error because you have done something wrong. That happens quite often. So being able to walk through step by step that, that training you're doing, that workshop you're doing, just to make sure that the things work the way you expect them to. That you can get them to work from a clean environment. So blowing away everything you have and starting from scratch. Well, that's another beauty of this lab is, is when you actually create it, it's, it's, you've got it at that starting point. And when you create a brand new one, it's at the starting point. So you don't have to like go delete a bunch of stuff and, you know, and, and, and then you don't delete something or you don't, you know, you know, or you delete too much or whatever the case may be. So you've got this, you can work and get yourself to a, known starting point for your lab. So that was also another good part about it. Sure, sure. I mean, it's one of the plus sides to doing cloud-based labs where like in Azure, when I'm done, destroy the resource group. Okay, if I need to do this again, I can start all over again, build the resource group, build the individual elements, uh, run the ARM templates, execute these steps. Then when I'm done, destroy it again. Well, that's the beauty of, uh, I use basically SQL Server data tools for a lot of my demos and stuff, because I can basically just destroy the database and then go SQL Server data tools, publish, done. And it's sitting there waiting for me in the new format, you know, back in the original format. Right. And uh, also Docker containers. like um, Yeah, Docker tomorrow, containers too, I'm yep. Doing a session on Spark streaming for the... Triangle Area's Spark user group, the lunchtime session. Uh, but I, I will have several Docker containers up and running because when I'm done, I can destroy them. Like, here's here's a whole Kafka cluster. Uh, here's a Cassandra setup. Destroy them when I'm done. Yeah. Well, and the, and the beauty, like I said, the other beauty is if you are a trainer and you become to where you're going to have a lot of these things, you can definitely save them off as as uh you know as images and stuff that you can pull back up later on you know so um you know maybe you want to use it a year from now or whatever the case may be just as long as you still have your azure account um you've got you've got access to it right but yeah if you're like if you're not in the cloud scenario uh docker container is probably one of the better options for getting back to known base state. But it is, True. Sounds like Azure Labs is a pretty good fit for the type of stuff Tom's talking about. Build well, I had VM. to do it for Windows. So Windows, was, you know, I needed the Windows environment. I could not run it with the Linux environment. Mm -hmm. So Because of always encrypted? Always encrypted, yep. So I needed to, I wasn't running it, and I didn't go do it with I gave them a script for for Azure Key Vault, but I, I didn't want to turn around and actually try to hook every all the VMs up to an Azure Key Vault or whatever. I was just like, oh, we'll just do it locally. You know, use a certificate store and be done. Right, right. If you want to use Key Vault? Here are some instructions. You can read them on your own time. Try it out on your own time. Yeah, have fun. Outside the context of the right. Okay, so the main topic for tonight, 
This comes from Raymond, who hit us at the end of our last episode, which was two weeks ago. Refactoring databases, practices and planning. So Raymond was interested in what are, what are thoughts on you have a database and you want to do refactoring. What types of things should you think about? Uh, what types of good practices are there? And what types of things should we absolutely avoid? I figured I would, I would start out by giving a brief concept of refactoring because in the dev world, uh, we tend to use refactoring as anything that makes things nicer or that we perceive to make it nicer. But it really has a specific meaning. And refactoring is just it's supposed to be what I would call a zero sum code change. In other words, it's not intended to make your code faster. It's intended to make maintenance easier. So your code should be doing approximately the same things, ideally running through basically the same processes or the same high level processes, but by reshaping the path in which you get through those processes, you make maintenance easier. So it's not intended to make things faster, to change their behavior, in fact, if you change behavior while you're refactoring, that's often a sign that the refactoring went wrong. So you should be able to have a set of unit tests, execute them, do whatever changes you want, execute them again, and zero tests should need to change. Everything should still succeed as, as before. Um, so the, the concepts, the types of things that typically are considered in refactoring be like, I have a single method that has a couple thousand lines of code. And by breaking this up into a lot of smaller function calls that do one thing, I'm still walking through effectively the same path. I just have more function wrappers. I have more, more jumps to functions as opposed to stepping through individual lines. And that can make debugging easier after the fact, but it doesn't make the code uh, faster. It doesn't make the code different. The behavior should still be the same. So we often think of refactoring in the database world as, well, I'm going to performance tune queries, or I'm going to change the structure of this table because I, I need to, say, support a larger number of rows than what we originally expected. Or I need to, ex to support larger data types than we originally expected. Technically not refactoring, but you know there, there are some things that I think we could consider refactoring in the data world. So I mentioned uh, breaking out segments of code in their own methods or their own functions. That's, that's something that happens a lot in classical programming. Less frequently in database work, but you could think about, I have a very long stored procedure. I can have sub procedures. And if it makes sense to have sub procedures, then um, that would be a case of refactoring. Uh, it can reduce performance. It can possibly make performance better. That those are more of the performance side effects of the change versus the intended result of making it easier to maintain just this procedure. In the application development world, separating things into different classes, trying to get better class boundaries in an object-oriented system. I don't think we have a really great analog in the database world. So if someone in chat wants to try me, uh, I'd be happy to, to hear that. Um, we could look at normalizing tables. So the queries themselves don't change. The inserts, updates, deletes, especially if you're using stored procedures as your interface, those don't change. That interface doesn't change. You still take in a set of values shaped a certain way. But if I modify the tables underneath to uh, maybe break things out to normalize them appropriately, and even if I still take in 
whatever that data structure looked like. And then in the stored procedure, I rejigger things so that I insert correctly into the, the new tables. That could be a scenario of refactoring. What about um, denormalization? Yes, that could also be a case if, you know, you want to go down that road. I'm not saying I want to go down that road, though. Come on. Uh, performance. All voice about cod or bust. You performance. Know. Well, the, the gonna... one thing that, that I would recommend as you look at refactoring things is also to know if you're going to do something with a table or restore procedure or whatever, you need to know what that object is touching that it references and what references that object. Uh, so I would highly recommend like a, a good um, documenting tool. We have, have actually use a third party Apex SQL documenter that does a very good job of that that I can turn around and look at a table and I can say, okay, here's all the store procedures or views that touch that table and here's the what doesn't. But be careful because what if you have things like when I came into this particular shop that I work at, basically I have a gentleman that he, he is a, um, he's really a product manager, but because they wanted reporting and didn't have anybody, they got SSRS set up, but instead of putting the SSRS code into store procedures or views or whatever the case may be, guess where they put it? Directly in reporting services reports. Directly in reporting services. So your problem then boils down to is if you go refactor something, are you going to really know everything that touches report? I don't know how many times we've changed something and broke the reporting services. Or uh, what about SSIS packages? You know, if you're using SSIS or now Azure Data Factory or whatever the case may be, you've got to right. you've got to really do a lot of due diligence before you decide to change things. And if you're in a shop like mine. Guess what I have? Entity framework. Entity framework. So that's you know I'm pretty much shot from making. So I want so for example, I want to do some refactoring encryption wise. Many years ago, we we built within that table we we uh, the social security number in the older older tables using cell level encryption. Hmm. And cell level encryption was really started back in 2005, you know? So, you know, we've got different procedures and functions and stuff like that that deal with that thing. And I wanna switch it to always encrypted. Okay. I can't switch it to always encrypted until I get with the developer basically to make his changes so that we can in turn handshake. Another good example is we use Windows certificates for always encrypted. I want to switch it to Azure Key Vault. Okay. I can't refactor that and change it to Azure Key Vault until I talk to the developer and we walk hand in hand. So I guess what I'm really saying is when you refactor, Normally, there's not just the database, or normally, there's not just the code. There's normally yeah, a lot of times there's two pieces to it, to the pie. So be right. careful. That's yeah. Those are those are really good points. Um, I would add on to this. You know, if you if you are talking refactoring, let's let's go strict definition of refactoring, but also broaden it out significantly to the sorts of say. Um, changes that don't necessarily provide direct business value. So you're not making the change because you're adding more information for the business units to use. Uh, you may not even be making the changes to support a new line of business or something. Just like um, we're gonna run out of rows. We have an identity integer and I need to change it to a big int. Or right. I have a string, here's a max length and I need to extend that. Or 
I have, you know, we can include performance problems in here. I have a query that's not performing adequately and I need to find a way of making it better. Um, I have, I have tables that, uh, you know, maybe we're experiencing issues because of not being appropriately normalized. So we have update anomalies, insert anomalies. Regardless of that, that let's just leave it at, this is not strictly for the business side. So you don't have a PM pushing down on engineering, on uh, application development and database development to say, we gotta get these things in. That it's instead more of an internal uh, database team driven initiative. A good example, Kevin, is like a, a function. For example, you got a function that's doing different things and stuff and you, and you wanna go add something to it and that, that particular item you're trying to add to it, it doesn't work in a function. You know, you gotta go do something now different to basically get it to work because you yeah, can no longer yeah, like, use a function. Especially like if you have a schema bound function and you wanna add right. something non-deterministic. Right. Or a view, a good example too is a view. You know, you're using a view and all of a sudden you want to put, you know, you need to do something and you can't use the view anymore. Uh, but. Right. So first thing I would say is, do you have the downtime to make these changes? Some of these changes may take a, decent amount of time, especially if you don't have Enterprise Edition of SQL Server. Some data type changes can be done essentially as metadata operations. So the extent of locking would be the amount of time it takes to take a, a schema modification lock and then make the change and close it. Which, assuming you don't have a large blocking chain as a result of this, uh, could be a couple milliseconds. So at its best, you, know, you could be talking about a couple milliseconds, no one's going to notice. At most, must be a network blip. I don't know, something was slow that day. Um, there are course, other you got changes. A, you got another one is a, a null to a not null. Yeah, uh, that actually is the other type. This is the, I'm going to have to scan the whole thing because... Right. The database engine needs to know, are there any values in here which are null? Even and if you, you may have, have to handle a, those. Yeah. Even if you have a constraint on it, a default constraint, well, they'll have nulls because the default constraint can be created after the fact. Um, right. So it'd have to do a scan and make sure you actually have any null values. So that's, that's the other side where, oh, we're going to have to do a full scan that can cause blocking depending on the size of your table. That may take a while, could be downtime. If you have the availability for downtime, easy recommendations, take it. You know, there I have an entire talk on uh, near zero downtime deployment strategies and all the things that you can do to try to get near zero, approach zero. Um, but the short version of it is, Look, if you can take that 20 minutes where the service, the service is offline and you can make your changes, life gets so much easier. Yeah, all, right. all of our releases are basically, we take downtime, we shut it down. And of course we're lucky that we're only a United States company pretty much. So, you know, we're only going from East coast all the way to Hawaii and stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, we got to, all during the middle of the night, we do all kinds of stuff. Right. Once it's once it's about midnight uh, East Coast time, the last Hawaiians have logged off and yeah, good to go. Yeah. Or we just kick them off nine o'clock at night East Coast. Uh, you're off. See ya. Three p.m. Go surfing. Yeah, go surfing. So, uh, next bit, I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy of it because. You know, when, when we talk refactoring, as a developer, uh, refactoring just feels so nice. And I want to make sure that there's actually a good reason. It's not just some instinctual uh, 
this is not my code, so I don't understand it perfectly, so it's bad code. And understand that code has a story. So there's a, a parable of Chesterton's fence. The idea of it is that a person sees a fence along the road and says, I don't understand why this fence is here. I want to take it down. The person he's with says, well, I'm not going to let you do that because you can't explain why the fence is there. If you can explain why the fence is there and explain why taking it down is a better thing, then maybe I'll let you take it down. But just because you see something that doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it actually doesn't make sense. It could be you're missing important context around that the value of that fence. And like in practice, that could be this fence was put up as a um, line of demarcation that we could see from a couple of miles away of where one set of property begins and another property ends. Uh, there are good reasons why that fence may be there, why it is still useful today. In code terms, you know, we can see some kind of ugly code and ugly implementations of things. Sometimes, the answer is the developer didn't know any better. Sometimes the answer is, yeah, we had to take shortcuts because the product team needed us to get this out in like two days and we had to build a whole product from scratch. So we just threw together stuff as fast as we could. I've had to maintain it since. If you know those stories you can explain, all right, well, that's why we have these bits. Uh, th then it becomes more reasonable to say, well, now that we know that, here's how we can make changes to improve this code base. If you don't know the story, there may be some ugly bits of code that may not be commented very well. You look at it and say, well, I, sh I should get rid of this. You get rid of this and all of a sudden everything breaks because, oh, that ugly bit of code was actually a bug fix that someone put in four years ago because some upstream service, occasionally they would send XML files with uh, invalid tokens in the middle, but well, only occasionally. Uh, well, a good example is um, many years ago, one of my developer friends, we were, you know, as a database guy, we're always saying set base, set base, set base, right? Run everything is set base. And we had this code doing, you know, processing some data. And of course I had it in set base and it wasn't fast at all. You know, it didn't really perform very well at all, even though everything was tuned and everything. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, let's just put it in a cursor and process it row by row and see if it's any faster. And we did that and it was multitudes faster. So hopefully you've got a good developer behind it and you would then comment the code and say, this was set based. It did not run well at all. Here was the performance. Uh, so it is now put into row by row processing and it was, you know, it improved by, I don't know, 10 or 20 fold. It was, it was significant. And I was like going, are you kidding me? You know, set base is supposed to be faster. And here we had this row by row, just beat the pants off of it. Right. Right. I'm, I was looking to see if Anders was in chat because uh, I'm sure he'd be pumping his fist and gloating right now hearing that story. Yeah. So, so hopefully you're following some coders that if you did something, um, if it's a bug, like you're saying, hopefully someone commented it and they put in the bug number and you're still in the same type of system you're using. So you can go reference that bug and go look and see what it, what it says or whatever, or they put enough information. In. You know, I'm not one that I will, that I really document things outside of the code. I would rather document things inside the code. So as you're reading it as a developer, you can kind of see and basically go, Oh, that's why he did what he did. Makes yeah. sense. Because uh, who's going to pull down a document off of a shelf and read it? Well, keeping it up. Nobody. Today, huh? A bigger problem. Yeah. Who's going to do it? Nobody. 
the fairly small so. percentage of people who choose to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very small percentage. Most of us have our bullhorns on and we just go through and do it. Right, right, because it's basically, all right, I got to get this done as fast as possible and then uh, move to the next thing really fast because I'm hitting four deadlines at once. Mike says he does that a lot. That's good. Um, if you are one of those people who keeps documentation well-managed and up-to-date, great, great. I wish there were more people like that. Well, the main thing the main thing I would tell you is um, if you are making some code that you think is obscure, then even um, go be sure and document it for someone to follow it and to, and see know where it is. I know that like if I'm writing a brand new store procedure or something that I want it to do something, a lot of times I will pseudo code it. I will basically go put all the comments of what I want to do and then I'll go put the code in between all of it. So you kind of then understand, oh, okay, I see what his logic is. I see what he's trying to do and why in the order he's doing it may not agree with what I do later on, but you at least see, you know, the order and why I did it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, mean, I think this is probably one of the critical things, especially if you are managing uh, code that's not yours originally. Uh, if it is yours originally, hopefully you remember why you did things. But even then, if I go back and look at code I wrote five years ago, like two, sometimes two about, years ago, I don't know what I wrote. Yeah, yeah, that's also true. You know, about ten percent of the time, I'm like, that guy was brilliant. I wish I was as smart as this guy. And ninety percent of yeah. the time, it's, what is this idiot doing to me? Yeah, I go look at the code and I go. Man, it's ugly code. Then I go look at who wrote it. I'm not going, oh, I wrote it. Right. And uh, then you're like, oh, I can do this so much better. But then you go back and you read back the notes and say, oh, well, we need this exception and we need this thing to happen. We need this process to happen at this time. And in order for this step to complete, we have to wait on this other thing. And um, then you go look at limitations in the systems and Oh, it has to be able to process this many rows per second. Say, oh, well, shoot, there's not as much as I thought I could do. It turns or you out turn this... around and see this anonymous uh, piece of data that, you know, just totally throws everything out of whack. Right. That you've got to go handle it. Right. And if if you were very diligent about creating tests during that process, it's a lot easier to remain humbled by... Uh, your desire to uh, change everything in the code base to be perfection. Like, oh yeah, that's right. I have to deal with this type of scenario where they sent, I have to reconstitute uh, the JSON because instead of using curly braces, they replaced them all with pipes or something awful. I think um, the worst thing that I see in the databases of the companies that I've been in and my career as a database professional is that the lack of archiving. Yeah, that the tables are just growing and growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many people have a true archiving routine out there or stuff. You know, some people may, but it's like, I don't know how many places I've walked into that there's no archiving routine. Just let it grow. Right. Yeah, until you run out of disk space, and then suddenly, well, we got to start dropping some stuff. Um, Mike mentions... Or, or we go buy more disk space. That's true. Get sysops to give you more space. Yeah. Brings up design versus code phase, keeping both in sync. Source control and DevOps integration helps a lot to solve the design and code sync issue. It helps. I think there's still a gap. And I, th I still love the idea of uh, runnable books. That that notion. Um, I forget who who it was. I want to say Azure DevOps has... or uh, Azure Data Studio now run books. Well, not not um, run books, not Jupyter notebooks. Jupyter notebooks are kind of along those lines. Um, but you can definitely do a lot of a lot of uh, commenting there nowadays. Yeah, yeah, you can you can uh, 
say integrate in commentary with code and i think i think that's helpful there was a slightly different metaphor where the commentary itself was the code and um i am blanking on the professor's name he wrote three books on algorithms they're like the three big books on algorithms it's the three volume set and i cannot remember his name but he had this notion of uh essentially uh knuth yeah don knuth thank you thank you mike i, I figured you would know who it was um but he had this idea that was not quite jupiter it was instead that it was almost it was almost a textual language that would compile to code so you write the text that becomes code c w e b that is or c web kind of c charlotte's web holdings that's not what it is <laughs> yeah yeah okay so TG just hit it. Um, C Web Computer Programming System by Knuth and uh, Silvio Levy. Uh, I was actually thinking of Web Literate. So, yes, there's this idea here that uh, you essentially write an article that becomes your source code, and Jupiter is a step in this direction, but instead of um, you know, freeform language then becoming code. It's more of code plus enriched documentation around it, which I think is, uh, it is helpful. It is absolutely an improvement over no documentation. It is an improvement over, uh, you know, a few, wor a few words of a comment above a gnarly bit of code. You know, you know another good place for documentation? What's that? Blog. Blog about it. So I had several years ago, I had to set up SSIS between uh, different domains, not just different, not on different computers, but on different domains and stuff. And trying to figure that out, how to do it and all that kind of stuff. And once I got it working, I actually turned around and, and blogged about it because I knew I'd never be able to set it up again unless, unless I technically documented it. So I documented it on my blog and it was the, the by far, it still is the largest hitting blog post that I had. So hmm. uh, of how to, how to go do that. So it can live on beyond you. And then not only your company, just as long as you're not, you know, putting your information out there, uh, company information out there, uh, but you could also help other people with it too. So depending upon what it is. Yeah, uh, Mike mentions that um, real programmers that design can't become code in reality. There are engineering implementation details in implementing an application, especially in compiled code where performance is controlled by the compiler. Rapid prototyping though, great for design. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Mike. Um, that's absolutely a challenge. It was, it was one of the huge challenges in this space. Um, another challenge is that our languages that we use are full of ambiguity. They're full of metaphor. They're full of allegory. We expect that the interpreter on the other side is going to be able to disentangle ambiguous words, that it will be able to deal with, you know, it'll be able to deal with homonyms. A machine is going to be much more literal about things, and that's why our, our languages tend to be very literal based. They're, they're, you know the functional side implementation of uh of functional mathematics uh the the c side c c i'm even i'm even doing awful puns now um if you look at the c the structure programming languages you know there's a branch of mathematics around that as well uh in the 90s we talked about compilers taking english instruction like knuth never happened yeah and in the 90s we 
you know, we were looking at rational rows as this is going to be the next big thing. It wasn't the next big thing. Um, the closest we've had is one of the most maligned languages around, and that's COBOL. COBOL is a very verbose language that is attempting to be a rough translation of, if you think in a very strict way, uh, you can almost read it as a person. Uh, and then everybody made fun of it because it takes so much time to write out a small program. To the point where COBOL is the butt of a joke now. Nobody, nobody wants to know COBOL. I don't know, it's, it's actually not that bad of a language, but that's, that's for another day. Also, I don't know any COBOL at all, so please don't hit me up with job offers in different states doing COBOL work, because even if I did know it, which I totally don't. You can make a lot of money being a COBOL programmer, because they're all dying off. That's true. Um, I mean, like, I'm not even, I'm not even ragging on COBOL at this point. Uh, UML, nah, you, I'll pass. Uh, so a little bit more on refactoring before we close out. You know, I, I hit on this a lot. Use stored procedures as an interface. One of the biggest, uh, tools that help you out with refactoring is interfaces. Decoupling. Sure different layers of applications saying, look, you don't have to know how I'm going to do it. Here is my promise. I promise you that I will give you back this thing if you give me this thing. Don't ask questions about how I get it. Don't ask, don't ask about my methods. Just accept that I will give you back this thing. The more you have that interface between uh, uh, functional layers, the, or functional domains, the better off you're going to be in the long run because that gives you the opportunity to make modifications in one place without changing everything else. If you don't have that perfect interface, which frankly we never do, uh, coordinate with developers. You know, even, even if I do have store procedures in place, I may still want to coordinate with them. Well, there's another thing besides stored procedures, views. Don't let them hit the tables directly. Make them go through views. Oh, you don't like that, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of views in the world. Um, conceptually, I can get behind it. Practically, uh, I've seen too many cases of views that end up destroying system performance. You know, I can I can understand theoretically, okay, uh, you can have views for different users that allow you to see different subsets of columns. If you have a view of a table, as opposed to a view of multiple tables joined together, maybe that's a little different, but... Yeah, that's uh, basically, you know, you know, you can write a crazy join view or whatever, but... But if you're just trying to obviate, you know, basically an abstraction layer away from the table so you can change it, then you could put a view that just kind of reads that table. Uh, a good example, Kevin, again, was years ago, we talking about archiving. Well, we had a system that it was taking 24, almost 24 hours to process. So we had to do something and uh, we had a table. And what we did is we renamed the, we created a view that looked exactly like the table. And then we renamed the, the underlying table and we were able to create an archiving system that archived the data off every single month and stuff with, with uh, by abstracting the table uh, as it looked, basically as large as it was, we, we created a view on uh, that looked exactly like the table. And then we could do all kinds of stuff underneath that we could archive. Right, right. And then you modify the code so it doesn't have to call that view and right. merge. You move well, away from it. Well, we actually kept the view all the time. We just basically, you know, we never changed it. The view was, you know, 
it, it look, you know, it was one of those old TB underscore type of things, but this was a view that was TB underscore, and it was because it was the table name was TB underscore. Yep, yep. You know, and all of a sudden you had this view named TB underscore. It's like, uh, that's why you don't name things TB underscore, right? Point. All right, we are going to wrap up shop talk. I have a few other thoughts around refactoring, but we are at the top of the hour. Uh, I'll include those in the show notes for us at shoptalk.tripass.org. Before we do cut out, Anders is looking for a DBA, and that link didn't work out very well. The whole thing is the link. Um, so he's looking for a DBA to join him. And also, Tom, you're looking for a DBA to join you? No, I was going to say, I'll, I'll join. No, I won't join oh. you. I, I'm getting ready to retire. I don't want to join anybody. Yeah, he's he's looking for somebody who's probably a little bit more junior, a little bit more junior than Tom. Um, but if you're interested, check out that link. Copy the whole text because the work it didn't work out so well. Um, I don't know if it's a remote position. It right yeah, now you, you probably to, is. It may be. Uh, I know that they are a distributed company. And also Tracy wasn't able to make it tonight, but she did want to pass along that um, she received details on an opening for a DBA with some SSIS experience in the warehousing world and some knowledge of Redshift is preferable. If you are interested in that, um, hit me up, email shoptalk at tripass.org and I will uh, put you in touch. We'll see if that's interesting. But with that, we are going to wrap up the show tonight. The Duke loves Redshift. I'm, I'm glad that you love Redshift. I'm, I'm not Redshift's biggest fan. Uh, not SSIS. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've grown to be not SSIS's biggest fan either. Uh, but we're going to wrap up for this evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming in, stopping by, chatting tonight. Hope we'll see you again next week. Great evening. All right. Have a good evening. Goodbye.